if our loved ones were still with us as possible. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We do indeed live in extraordinary and worrying times. This is a period of great uncertainty, of the unknown. We have so many questions and so few answers, and we now enter a time with this legislation that we would never have thought of only months, if not weeks ago. I must pay tribute, like others in this chamber, to the NHS staff, the key workers, the front line, the blue lights, those who are going over and above at this time. Just a few short months ago, these people were having to take strike action in order for their voices to be heard on equal pay, and now we are calling on them with extreme pressure being put on them, literally tasked with saving people's lives. They are the ones coming in on their day off to record powerful social media videos to try and encourage people to do the right thing. Nurses and healthcare staff are having to be redeployed, retrained in an emergency situation. And there also have also been great examples across Northern Ireland of community cohesion, of those volunteering their time and services to help the elderly, the vulnerable and for those who are isolating. Businesses are offering free services to coordinate help, community groups doing the rounds identifying people who need it, offers of dog walking, of shopping or just a phone call for a chat on the phone. It is heartwarming to say the least and it will not be forgotten. And our condolences must also be extended to families who have already been bereaved by COVID-19. And now to the bill in this chamber today. Appropriate and necessary measures need to be taken by the government and governments across the UK and Ireland to protect our health and protect our lives. But we have serious concerns with this bill, most of which have already been covered either in this chamber or in the House of Commons yesterday. And I will not go over old grounds and address what other members have already spoken about, but I do need to highlight some key issues. The government wishes to have this bill in place for two years, which is far too long. They want parliamentary scrutiny after one year, again, far too long, and raises significant concerns over necessity and proportionality. I welcome the six-month amendment, but we have to ask ourselves, does it actually go far enough? We need in this chamber and in Westminster is frequent reviews of the provisions so that they are, so that they are called on, switched on at the time, and we need to ensure that human rights are complied with and that there are proper checks and balances on what government powers are being utilised for. Provisions allow for the detention of people who are potentially infected, with police and immigration officers empowered to use reasonable force to implement these laws. But what of those with mental health conditions? Fewer doctors' opinions are required fewer certifications and the extension or removal of certain time limits for detention and transfer. In Northern Ireland, this will also remove the need for an approved social worker to carry out certain functions. Timelines will be changed and people with mental health conditions can be detained longer. We must proceed with extreme caution here. In Northern Ireland, we don't have any independent mental capacity advocates yet. Do unapproved staff have the experience and the expertise to make these types of decisions? Will there be a review after this period of time is over to ensure that all those placed under a de deprivation of liberty safeguard was done so properly? Within our prisons, we heard from the Minister yesterday, the challenges faced by the service should not be underestimated. We have just under 1,600 people in custody, and we know that many of those there suffer from mental health conditions, have addiction issues, and have a history of self-harm. Many of those in prisons fall into the high-risk category in terms of age and medical condition, and we need to ensure that those otherwise would have, who have had visits from their families and others continue to happen in different forms, and all measures are being put in place to facilitate contact given the daily struggles, particularly around mental health and attempts to continue, continue some sort of family and social structure. We must ensure support is there for our prison staff, mainly many of whom are facing difficult decisions over their family with childcare issues and safety and work. We must be aware that if any prisoners are subject to early release, that this does not have adverse impacts on victims or those who are in for sexual or domestic violence offences. And I would encourage the department to ensure that the description they use for these categories of prisoners must be fully checked, balanced and necessary. Many of the measures highlighted in this bill raise concerns over human rights and personal liberty by removing individual freedoms. While it is understandable that the government has serious concerns on the system's capacity to cope, which is inherently true with our health service, this should not result in the circumstances of lack of scrutiny, oversight, protocol in place for people's protection and regulation, which could lead to abuse of power and unnecessary suffering. What of the testing levels? And I note the Minister's comments earlier on introducing this um, LCM, but is it enough? 
The bill does not adequately address how to prevent such abuses, nor it does not include provisions to protect the most vulnerable in our society, who will undoubtedly be the worst hit during this crisis. And I would encourage the government to put in all necessary provision in place to ensure that all people are protected during this time. With the Prime Minister's statement last night, the country is in a stage of lockdown, with some serious restrictions on movement to be enforced. But we do not actually know what this means for people who need to put food on their tables. And we must get detailed information for people who need it the most. How is this going to be enforced? When? What does it mean about the use of force equally across the board? And where is the oversight? I got messages last night after Barca's statement from concerned parents. Would they be allowed to bring their children to another parent's house? How does this work for family members who care for one another but don't live together? Will they be fine for bringing their kids to their mother's house or vice versa? This, not to mention the fact that we don't know how long this will be in place for, is putting fear into the heart of our society. Under this bill, the PSNI will be given new powers to enforce isolation when a transmission control period has been declared. It is presumed that police officers and public health officers will consult before people are taken in for testing. But the lack of stringent protocol in this regard is quite striking. Limited detail on who public health officers are and where do people go after testing. Where are these test centres and how are these risks being managed? We have little clarity here on how this will be enforced and no clarity on the legal boundaries. We also have to be minded on what is not in this bill, specifically protections for our most vulnerable and any further clarity that we so desperately need. Where are the protections for those who rent, even if they are lucky enough to receive wages from an employer, having to continue to pay landlords who are receiving a mortgage holiday, and for those already facing eviction in the private rented sector, what do we do about them? How can this be managed to ensure that we do not have people losing their homes in general, especially at this time? And how are frontline workers being drafted full-time into work, or increased hours going to pay for increased childcare need? Will the childcare even be open? What are the provisions for those who have no recourse to public funds, for those in the precarious immigration system? What of those in poverty who struggle daily and are facing this crisis too? What of those currently in an abusive household, as well as those that may find themselves in an abusive household throughout this time? Will someone, say, who lives in a domestic violence situation be forced back into that home by the very authorities that are there to protect them? What about those who are homeless? How will they support it, be supported in a safe, secure and rights-based manner? And how we can, can we protect them and surely that they can be safely isolated? I have been asking, but I still have not received any answers. Will government increase funding for staff workers and refuges, for hostel provision, and ensure that these frontline workers are protected in this crisis too? Will we have a fully funded and resourced mental health system to deal with the reality of what we're facing now and in the future? Where is the support for the zero-hour contracts, for the agency staff, the freelancers, the self-employed, like my father, the sole earner of his household, who will now have to make the difficult choice not to work with minimal future income to protect himself and my family? I noted the comments made by Mr Nesmith about the construction sector, but how am I supposed to advise my father when he wonders if he should go to work as a self-employed builder if he cannot get the materials that he needs? How are they to pay their bills, their rent, buy their food and necessary items? It certainly won't be covered by statutory sick pay. No matter when it can be applied from, it's simply not enough. Could anyone in this chamber actually live on £94 a week and meet their financial commitments? Those gardeners, builders, carpenters, plasterers, plumbers, electricians, the personal trainers, the musicians, the therapists and counsellors, photographers, yoga teachers, the makeup artists and the beauty therapists, the comedians, the suppliers, the middlemen and women, the small business owners who have no staff, those with no premises. The list is not exhaustive, but it's just a taste of the people who have been reaching out for help. Do they go and get a business loan, which they will have to pay back, which is not a wage, but just kicks the financial can down the line? MLAs have been inundated with queries, and of course we've had our own, but we have constituents asking what's going to be in place for them, and we still do not have any answers. Why did we not use this opportunity to put in a universal basic income? It was a complete missed opportunity. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I opened with, appropriate and necessary measures need to be taken by government, but we do need to continue with appropriate checks and balances, and ordinarily I could never support something like this, which is so far-reaching and life-changing. I note that Scotland are supporting this LCM, but they are also working to bring their own emergency legislation into play. And I wonder and welcome the comments from Mr Given earlier on in this too. Could this Assembly not do this too? Or are we content in following Mr Johnson? 
Never before have we been asked to provide consent so much for so much curtailment in society, and only in these exceptional circumstances can this happen. Thank you. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I won't take long, Minister, and I think there are more questions than answers. But just to say that um, I hope that in the coming days that they.